Hi, everyone. My name is Dawn Lewis, and I am so excited to welcome you on behalf of the Nichelle Nichols Foundation to our Zoomcast today. So you could be anywhere on a Sunday morning, but you're here with us, and that means the world to us. Now, we're going to talk science, but we're going to talk science from a perspective that you probably didn't even realize existed. So first and foremost, again, my name is Dawn Lewis. I work in the film and television and music industry, and I am especially excited to be here today because Miss Michelle Nichols, she was not only my hero, she was my inspiration, but most importantly, she was my friend. I met Michelle, wow, more than 30 five years ago when I first came here to Los Angeles, like I introduced by some mutual friends and I had to tell her that she changed my life. As a young girl, when the first Star Trek series came on in the early 60s, I got to see someone who looked just like me. And not only did she look like me, but she was brilliant. She was beautiful. She was capable. She was holding her own. And people were coming to her for information. I didn't know that a person of color, that a woman of color could be thought of and engaged in that kind of way. So she changed my life. And Mr. Roddenberry, yeah, there we are at one of her famous Leo birthday parties. She had lots of friends who were Leos. She was not a Leo, but she liked to celebrate life and celebrate those that she loves. So every summer, every August, we would be at her house having a great time. So when I got the job to be the voice of Captain Carol Freeman, in Star Trek Lower Decks, you know one of the first people I called? Nichelle, to say you will never believe the job I just got. And I can't believe it's full circle because you inspired me. You let me know, you let so many people of color know that we're not only a part of the future, but we belong there. And we can make inroads and we can be innovators and we can be instigators of change. So I thank you. Nichelle, and I thank all of you for being here. I was fortunate enough to share another conversation of love and inspiration with her just days before she transitioned. She was a blessing to me and so many others, which you're going to hear today. So let me welcome our guest for today's panel. But first and foremost, I want to introduce someone who is special to Nichelle from the day she opened her eyes on this earth. Please welcome Miss Nichelle Nichols' sister, Miss Marion Smothers, the president of the Nichelle Nichols Foundation. Marion? Good morning, everybody. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Um, oh my God, I'm, I miss her so much. Mm -hmm. uh, she was um, just a great, I know she was influenced you guys through her television work and all of that, but she was my first influence from like the time I can remember my big sister dancing down the hall in her um, ballet shoes and doing pirouettes in the living room. And she was a fabulous dancer. Um, I'm probably remembering her when she was like 14 or 15 years old. And I was just um, hanging on her every word or every movement. Um, I'm really, really very happy to be able to represent, be the face of representing um, the foundation. Uh, we hope to really be able to um, help a lot of young girls um, reach their dreams, make their dreams come true, and be able to be a force uh, within that to be able to enable them to get their help to through our foundation be able to help and inspire um, young people young women young girls to be all that they can be and mm -hmm. reach for the stars I'm just so happy to be here and in the presence of all you very learned and wonderful people. Thank you. Thank you so much for being now, here. Oh, I just wanted to show you a really yes. quick a picture of someone asked me to show you all. And this is a picture of Nichelle and I some years ago. I think I was celebrating my 50th uh, birthday party and we both wore red, but that's me and my big sister and how I'll always remember her as being there for me, being there for us, our family members. Um, just, uh, 
I can't well, you know, tell you, you know. <laughs> Marion, it must have been something for you to share her with literally the world. That's your big sister, but you had to share her with the world. So what are some of the things that the foundation is looking forward to doing? I know we talked about them doing a space camp and other programs like that. Yes, the our first um, venture out there will be the space camp in uh, next year, June of 24. And so we are preparing for that and getting sponsors what we want is for what we're looking for people to be able to sponsor at least one girl space camp cost a little under uh, two thousand um, dollars mm -hmm. per girl. We're hoping to send at least fifty girls to space camp. Uh, so if anyone out there is um, wants to sponsor a young girl that is interested in. Um, technology, the STEM program, the STEAM program, because it's going to mm -hmm. include those that are uh, artists um, and want to pursue their dreams in the arts as well as STEM program. Uh, we're here for you, and um, we certainly would love to hear from you and uh, be able to help uh, support us in that. Thank you. Thank okay, you. so... Ladies and gentlemen, as you are watching today's program, please keep that in mind. The information as to where you can donate is going to be crawling across the screen throughout the program. So this, this panel and panels like it as we move forward, because we're going to be doing these pretty regularly, are to reflect to you, this is what a scientist looks like. It's not some stuffy, crazy, wild-haired person who you could never be. You too. By the end of this conference or maybe one of our future panels can see yourself and hopefully be inspired. So please sit back, relax, and let's get into our panel. First, I would love to introduce to you our amazing group of panelists who are all scientists, and I will introduce the group. First and foremost, we want to introduce Dr. Kara Brugman. She's an experimental petrologist. Hi, Kara. Hi, Don. Hi Don there. Here. Next, I'd like to introduce Ms. Naya Butler Craig. She is a student in aerospace engineering. Hey, Naya. Hi, Don. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ron Gamble Jr., who's an astrophysicist. Hey, Ron. Hi. How's everybody? Now, look, if you can look closely at Ron's wall behind him, <laughs> that's what he did before breakfast today, working out that, that theory and that <laughs> equation. Real. That's that's real. That's his real work on a regular basis. Amazing. Next, I'd like to introduce Miss Ideal Gonzalez Ericchio. She's a scientist and an educator. Hi, Ideal. Hola. Hola. How is everyone? And last but absolutely not least, Dr. David Williams, a research professor. Hi, Don. Hi, everybody. Great to be here. So we've got engineers, astrophysicists petrologists, teachers, professors. This is aerospace engineering. You guys run the gamut. And I have to tell you, you probably look absolutely nothing like what our audience expected a scientist to look like. So let's get right into it. Our first question is share one or two cool things that have nothing to do with science, but somehow is helping you make science fiction into science fact. Let's start with Kara. Well, you mentioned that I'm an experimental petrologist. I bet a lot of people don't know what that means. Basically, I'm a geologist and I make lava. So the stuff that comes out of volcanoes, I make that in my lab. And right now what I'm doing is I'm making exoplanet lava. So lava that could be on a planet that's somewhere else in the galaxy, not in our solar system. And one of the big things that I think of when I think of science fiction, especially when I think of Star Trek, are all of the cool aliens that you get to encounter. And I think that's one of the biggest questions we have is, is there life on other planets? And if there is life, would we be able to recognize it, right? Because maybe there's some life out there that's so different from us, we wouldn't even know what it was. So my experiments are helping us to figure out whether exoplanets can support life for a really long time. Like, I bet a lot of you know that water is really important for life. But it's not just that there's some water, there has to be the right amount of water, not too much, not too little. 
And there also has to be certain elements present on the planet that life needs to make cells, your skin, your hair, and your bones, and also things like phosphorus and carbon that make up your DNA and other parts of your body. So the experiments that I'm doing are going to help us figure out how to narrow down our search for life and figure out which exoplanets are the best places to look for life. So hopefully, eventually, we'll get to meet an alien one day. So creating lava, is that to create the elements, all of the things that you just said that can sustain life, that can uh, help us discover places where we can further exist? Yeah, I use uh, basically a big hydraulic press that simulates the temperatures and pressures deep inside a planet. And the video that's showing right now is um, of a different type of experiment I do where I basically have a little blob of lava and then I'm dropping it into a pan of water to instantly freeze it so I can see what was happening in that lava when it was still molten. And when I make the lava, I'm seeing when you melt the mantle of a planet, when you melt the inside, what happens? Um, are the parts that melt, are those things that animals and plants can use or do we not get enough of those things that life needs? So what exactly do you use to make lava? It's There are a couple of different devices. One is called a piston cylinder, and then one that goes to even deeper pressures is called a multi-anvil. And these are huge instruments. Um, some of them are eight feet high. Here at Arizona State University, where I'm currently a research scientist, we're getting a new 6,000 ton multi-anvil press. This is gonna let us go deep into the mantle and the earth, to see what kinds of minerals and things are hanging out there. Now, I just got back from the Grand Canyon where there are layers and layers and layers of different colors, sediment, soil, volcanic activity that shows a different time period, the millions of years and changes that this planet has gone through. So all of that, does that sound like that's part of the research that you do? It is. I do field work okay. in places, not specifically the Grand Canyon, but in like Yellowstone and the Cascades in California, where we collect samples of those rocks that were deposited by volcanoes, basically frozen or solidified lava, take them back to our lab and then either do analyses on them to figure out what they're made of, or we take a look at them, grind them up and put them in those big machines I was telling you about to see what happens when we melt them. Wow. That's phenomenal. Okay, so everybody out there who made a volcano for your science project in school? This is where it could head. You can do <laughs> it. <laughs> wow. Okay, next, Naya. Same I question. Like, it's hard, hard to follow that up. You're doing such cool and exciting work, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, I guess my favorite way to explain what I do, um, and just to reiterate, I'm actually a PhD student at Georgia Tech, and uh, my field is aerospace engineering, but my research area is called uh, space electric propulsion. And so if you're familiar with Star Trek, you may also be familiar with Star Wars. And if you've heard of TIE fighters, the twin ion engines, they are these electric rockets that go really, really fast and zip you around with a pretty blue light behind them. Um, as their rocket plume. And so that is exactly what I work on. Um, I don't work on ion propulsion. I Well, I'm sorry, I don't work on ion thrusters. I work on something called a Hall effect thruster, but um, they're both in the same category of, of the propulsion, um, of electric propulsion. And so are they as fast and as sensationalized as they are in Star Wars? Absolutely not. Um, the reason why that they are desirable for um, space exploration missions is because they're extremely efficient and they're more suitable for long duration space exploration missions. So if you're thinking about Mars and beyond, that is a very suitable propulsion system to use as your primary propulsion system. Um, and so that is my work and it's really exciting. It's, um, it's one of those sci-fi things that are reality that I actually get to do every day. Um, and it's really fun. So that's me. <laughs> so which which comes first? Because when we're watching those movies like Star Wars and Star Trek, they talk about dilithium crystals. Now we know they made that up. It's right. two lithium, two lithium, dilithium, two lithium. They make so much stuff up. So which comes first, the science or the fiction? Or does the mm -hmm. fiction inspire to say, you know what, what if that was really a thing? Let's see if we can make that work. Is that how it goes? 
That's a great question. I think I, I would imagine that there's two there. It, it's a two way street. Like sometimes fiction inspires the science. Sometimes science inspires the fiction. However, in this case, I believe it was the science that inspired the fiction because the ion thruster is actually very real. Um, and its first time being flown was back in the 60s. So it's not a, a, a new okay. propulsion or technology. Um, it is a very real thing and it's very sci fi looking. If you've ever seen one, I wish I had a photo. Um, if you just look up Ion Thruster right now, I'm sure everybody's on the computers. Get your Google tab open. Just look up Ion Thruster. You will see a big circular kind of device or cylindrical kind of device with a pretty blue light behind it. So imagine how that looks. It, it looks very fun in sci-fi. And so my assumption is that Star Wars saw that and was like, that's our TIE fighter. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to do that. Okay, but I would encourage each of you, get a pen and some paper. Mm -hmm. Yes, I still use pen and paper. And if you hear anything really cool, write it down. Don't Just Google it while we're doing it the panel. Down. There you go. <laughs> so that you can Google it after the panel, because I don't want you to miss anything, okay? Because everyone is going to say something really exciting. So if you have a question or you have a thought, it's like, oh my God, I wonder if that's a real thing. <laughs> write it down so you can Google it after the panel. So we don't want you to miss anything, okay? <laughs> All right, next, Dr. Ron Gamble Jr., our astrophysicist. What's up, Ron? Fiction to fact. How do you do it? Oh, my gosh. Everything I work on is in science fiction. <laughs> um, so I, I'm a theoretical astrophysicist at NASA Goddard, um, and I research the physics and the theory, the mathematical theory behind black holes and some of the space time around black holes and the other structures that we that's called relative physics jets that's kind of blasting off black holes. Uh, so... It's all science fiction going to science fact here. One of the things that I'm working on now is looking at very, trying to uh, look at and develop the theory around looking very, very close to the black hole um, at something called the event horizon. And so if you've seen Interstellar, if you've seen any black hole movie or any movie with black holes, you've talked about an event horizon, you've talked about how you can't cross it, it's the point of no return, oh my gosh, but... It, it is science fact. Those things actually exist. They are kind of points of no return in the universe. Um, but my research is focused on figuring out the physics behind some of those mechanisms and what happens to matter very, very close to the event horizon. So matter gets shredded apart at incredible speeds. We're talking about near the speed of light or at the speed of light. Um, and it's taking the space time, it's taking the matter moving around it, it's taking the universe to extreme measures. This is in a very extreme environment that is very, very energetic. The gravity is extremely powerful. Um, and you see weird stuff happening around the black hole also. If you've seen a picture, so another keyword is gravitational lensing. So people write that down, <laughs> take notes. And, and that's what happens to light that travels around the black hole. It lends, it literally bends around the black hole due to gravity. So that's a phenomena that we're looking at around the black hole event horizon and around jets. These jets are very, very long structures that are thousands of light years across. So one light year is about 3 million miles. So you can wow. figure, yeah, thousands of light years. We're talking about 30 million, 300 million miles across. So in Star Trek terms, we're talking about parsecs, right? So parsecs are about 3.26 light years. So these are really, really large structures and they're very, very energetic. They're some of the most energetic events in the known universe. Um, and so these things are at the very centers of active galaxies that we look at. Um, they're called supermassive black holes, but I study a particular type of those called blazars. Blazars are supermassive black holes with jets pointing directly at us. We're not worried about them. They're millions of light years away. We have no problems with them. Don't panic. But it allows us to kind of hear kind of down the barrel point of view at these black holes, get a little top down view. And then we look at other samples that are kind of tilted to the side. So we have kind of a complete perspective on what these black holes look like. And we take pictures, we collect data. I am particularly looking at X-rays, gamma rays, these things called cosmic rays. And then there's another very, very energetic one called ultra high energy cosmic rays. And you can, you can Google all of this later too. <laughs> He's all okay. of the mathematics you see behind me is all of my work. So this is a this is a real background. 
<laughs> this is real work right here. You can look up my paper. It's published online. Um, and that's some of, the, some of the exciting things that I work on. Okay. So you're saying we have black holes right here in our galaxy. Are those the ones you're studying? Or how do you possibly see a black hole somewhere in some other galaxy? Yeah, so there's the, the closest supermassive black hole to us is at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. It's called Sagittarius A star. Um, and it spins relatively, it spins very fast. Um, and so we use a combination of telescopes, both in the ground and in the spa in space space, to kind of compile different modes of information together. We're looking at radio waves, microwaves, x rays, gamma rays, all of them, to put one succinct image together. So if you've seen the Event Horizon Telescope image, that's exactly what we're doing. That's what it is. So there's a okay. new mission that I'm working on at NASA called the Event Horizon Explorer, which is the Event Horizon Telescope, but in space. So it's going to be able to look very deeper and deeper into a black hole with much greater clarity. So look out for that mission as it comes up, I would say in another 10, 10 or so years. NASA missions, as you know, move very slow, but they're very good once they go up. Okay, so you're saying that a black hole is basically the horizon. If you fall into a black hole, if you could fall into a black hole, there's a that's the point of no return, matter ceases to exist. So then would you consider the wormhole that takes you from one end of time and space through to another dimension of time and space? Is that the fiction that is yet to be proven as fact? That is that is the fiction. And I would say a lot of people don't don't realize that black holes are, they're not actual holes. They're not the funnel structure you see online or in pictures. They're spheres. They're very dark. They're black spheres. So a wormhole would be one sphere in one point in space-time and another one in another point in space-time, and they bridge together. So it's a bridge in space-time. They're called Einstein-Rosen bridges, actually. And so mathematically, we can write them down, uh, but we've, we've yet to see one. So okay. in theory, these these might be artificial structures that we might be able to create later on. Once we, if we can use Naya's ion propulsions to get to a black hole, <laughs> we, can, we can probably build an Einstein-Rosen bridge or wormhole. And see Excellent. A black hole. Excellent. David Williams, our research professor, what is your fiction to fact? Hello, everybody. I am a, a research professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University, same place that uh, Kara is. And uh, I'm a planetary geologist. And what I do is I study images from NASA's robotic spacecraft that explore the other planets and moons and asteroids of the solar system and try and figure out what geological processes work on these various planetary bodies. And I make geological maps that describe the geologic histories of these uh, objects. Um, I've had a 34 year career in planetary that I was inspired to get into from growing up watching the original Star Trek as a kid in the 70s and seeing mm -hmm. Nichelle and the other actors play these characters exploring planets. And I've had the good fortune to work on the Magellan Venus orbiter, the Galileo Jupiter orbiter that studied the four planet sized moons of Jupiter, uh, the European Mars Express orbiter studying the surfaces of Mars, and uh, last decade, the NASA Dawn mission, which visited the two most massive objects in the main asteroid belt, which is asteroid number four named Vesta, and the dwarf planet Ceres, a space mission that was powered by solar electric ion propulsion. And currently, <laughs> I am the, uh, the deputy lead of the imaging camera that is on the NASA Psyche spacecraft that is scheduled to launch in October of this year. That is going to visit asteroid number 16 named Psyche, and that is the largest M-class asteroid. In this case, M-class stands for metallic. We think it is the exposed core of an asteroid parent body. The crust and mantle were knocked off by giant impacts and we have an exposed planetary core, something we've never been able to study before. Wow. So when we launch this year and we send our spacecraft there, my job is gonna be able to make the geological map and analyze and find out what materials are, are gonna be there. What does geology look like on a world made out of metal? We know what it looks like on worlds mm. made out of rock, worlds made out of dust, worlds made out of ice, but not worlds made out of metal. So it's gonna be true exploration when we see what happens there, uh, when we start getting the results from that mission at the end of this decade. Wow. So uh, as far as your science has gone so far, 
are there any other planets similar to ours that have uh, an, 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 an aquatic element to their planet? Or is ours the only one that has water so far? Uh, what in, what we know as, as water. Yeah, the, there's indications as we study exoplanets, stars around, um, uh, planets around other stars in our galaxy, that there could be water vapor in the atmosphere. It's, and the implication could be uh, that maybe someone, some might have oceans. But within our own solar system, we are finding that some of the icy moons of the gas giant outer planets like Jupiter and Saturn actually have liquid water oceans in their mm. interiors underneath icy crust. And we're getting to ready to launch a mission to Jupiter's moon Europa. It's called Europa Clipper. That's going to launch next year in 2024. And currently, I am working on a geological map of Saturn's moon Titan, uh, which is the largest moon of Saturn, larger than the planet Mercury, in fact. And that does have liquid bodies on its surface, but mm -hmm. those are liquid bodies of hydrocarbon, methane and ethane, in lakes okay. and oceans on the surface. And that's protected because that moon is the only moon in the solar system that has its own atmosphere. So that allows it to occur there. So really exotic worlds, even within our own solar system, worthy of the world that Star Trek takes us to. That's so exciting. That's really exciting. So thank you, everyone here. Okay, as the listening audience, you can tell that while each of their disciplines are so diverse, there's overlap and there's synergy and one garners information from the other to help their own research. So there's so many different facets to science. It's not all beakers and uh, Petri dishes and different things like that. So if each of you, what are some attributes that make a good scientist. And this wasn't part of the original question I had for you, but now looking at you, you are all so many different ages. Okay, so I'm really curious, and maybe the audience is as well, if you don't mind saying how old you are and what your journey was into science, what got you into science? Do you have any any degrees? Did 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 you have an inspiration? Was it a TV show? What was it a teacher? You know all those kinds of things that led you to pursue the path that you were on now. And you know besides it being an interest, but actually to propel you to not just being a scientist, but being uh, someone who excels in their field. So. You guys, this is what a scientist looks like, not what you expected. All different nationalities, all different ages, and I'm certain all different journeys. So by all means, please. Carol, let's start with you, with you again. Uh, well, I'm actually probably older than you think I am. I'm 41, and science is actually my second career. So I started out in radio, TV, film production, actually, and I realized I really miss science. So I went back to school as an adult. I was a lot older than my classmates when I got my second undergraduate degree um, and decided to go into science, to go into planetary science, to study exoplanets and specifically volcanoes. So what makes a good science scientist? What makes it more than a hobby for you? I, th I think the main thing is tenacity. So that means the ability to keep going, even if things aren't going exactly the way you planned, or maybe you're not getting the result that you wanted. There's some kind of roadblock, but you can figure out a way to push through. A lot of science does not go the way you want it to. You are not going to get the result you want, probably 90% of the time. But the important thing is that you know how to learn from the things that didn't go quite the way you expected and turn that into something that'll help you move forward to the next step. I think it's also really important that you're able to cooperate with people and communicate with the people around you in a positive and constructive way. A lot of times, in, there's this, this idea in a lot of media where it's a scientist wearing their lab coat, slaving away in their lab all by themselves, and it's they're writing a paper. You know, it's like all very isolated. And in my experience anyway, that's that's not what a lot of science is about. Usually there's some kind of team that you're working with. You usually have at least one colleague that you're speaking with or bouncing ideas off of. So it's really important that you can you can work well with other people. Are there many women? I'm sorry. Oh, I there are a lot of women. Well. Actually, my lab when I was getting my PhD was all women for most of my PhD. Um, but I, I did want to point out that something that I don't think you need to be a good scientist is you don't have to look or dress a certain way. 
You don't have to go to a certain school and you definitely don't have to only be interested in science. Everyone here, every scientist I know of has a lot of interests that have nothing to do with science. And I think it's actually surprising how many parts of science actually look like things that you might do in your free time for fun, especially in geology. There's a lot of you know being outside and just looking at cool scenery. Um, so if you're whatever you're interested in, there's something for you in science. Excellent. Thank you. OK, Naya. Hi, I just want to interrupt. Did we hear from Ideal? Did we hear from Ideal at all? Ideal, did I not ask you the previous question? No. Yes. Please forgive me. Please <laughs> forgive me. Thank you, Marion. Ideal, please. Yes. What is what is your fiction to fact? I apologize. Oh, no worries. I'm a molecular geneticist, developmental biologist, and um, what I work on, my choice organism are nematodes. I look at worms. And looking at worms and looking at soil, actually, I'm now a PI for this citizen science project called Soil Science Lab. I work in connection with a, a wonderful colleague of mine. She's currently at John Hopkins, Sabrina Khan. And we launched the citizen science project that every person around the world from five to 105 could actually participate and see the microbiomes within the soil, take a snapshot of the environment and see what's going on and allowing students from ages five to 105 to really find ways to solve problems as well as uh, justice. Uh, so environmental justice is redlining. So using science to say, mm -hmm. Call you know you know call truth to power and say what's going on. Not only do I do that, I also study um, trying to do a microgravity project, looking at nematodes with ch which has Alzheimer's um, because in my family there's a lot of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So looking at methodologies to see if microgravity can be used as a tool to either halt or deliver. Let's see what is happening to the organism that is not able to you know which doesn't have gravity acting upon it. Do we see the nerves grow? Are my worms do they have it? They don't hatch out of their eggs. So I'm wondering, does it hatch out? And another project uh, that I do is I'm actually an educator as well from kindergarten to graduate school. And I also mentor educators to say how to bring multiculturalism and social justice in the STEM curriculum, because that is not being done. So that's why I yeah. kind of straddle both worlds. I'm a researcher, I'm a scientist, but I'm in the lab, um, I'm in the lab, but in students' labs and teachers' labs and saying, here, let's do it now. You don't have to wait to college to solve a problem. So I have a student who yeah. just patented just a week and a half ago, here, science fiction to science fact. We created a moldable slime battery. Oh, wow. That's right. And, <laughs> and this, so I'm able to talk about it, but it just... You know, there was a problem like this took, takes too much real estate. Um, how can we make it lighter? How can it be safer for the environment? So that's my science fiction to science fact. Yeah. It all started with a cockroach. It all started with cockroach. <laughs> and Nichelle Nichols, because she looks like one of my tias. And I'm like, holy stuff. The cockroach story could read in my bio. But when I saw Lieutenant Uhura, and I'm like, no way. She's my tia. She could speak many languages and she knows how to fight. And a scientist. And, yes. a <laughs> and I went, forget about it. That's what I want to do. And I had to struggle and overcome a lot of challenges because someone like me from the South Bronx, Puerto Rican, first generation to even go through high school, not go to college. It was not expected. And uh, Naya and I just connected because Gem Fellowship was a great lift up. That's amazing. So, okay. I'm sorry. Somebody had a question. Thank you, Marion. Thank you for pulling anybody. If I miss you again, please just say, hey, hey, go on. Excuse me. It's just that everybody is so interesting and um, things that I've I've never even heard of. You know, so this is like I feel like I'm back in school. I love it. Right. I love it. So, so ideal. I'm from Brooklyn. I'm from Bed Stuy. So I completely relate to what you were talking about, where it's just not expected of you based on the neighborhood you come from and the color of your skin and the school you went to. You know, all of those things are supposed to be limiters. So anyone watching this, I really hope if you get nothing else that you see there is no limit if you decide 
there is no limit. Whatever is inside of you to, to dare to keep asking the next question and listening for and looking for the answers to take you to the next step, the next level. So uh, ideal, since we're still talking to you, please, uh, you mentioned a little bit about your journey and Michelle inspiring you to keep move, moving forward. How old are you now? Are you in your 20s? 30? Uh -oh. No, keep on going up. Seriously. No way. Get out of town. Okay. All right. You know, you know, you know how they say black don't crack. Okay. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come it's on. It's that Taino blood. Yellow, yellow, tan. We are all in this thing together. Let's keep that mixture happening. I'm actually 93. So anyway. <laughs> oh, you're older than I am. I thought and I was see? the oldest one on the block. No, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. So I want okay, to so add one thing. I want to sure. add the because I do want to challenge educators or STEM, um, just educators and mentors. How were you, you introduced to science? Good or bad? And then yeah. if it was great, pass it on. And then if you're an educator or in STEM, you know, inspirational courses, you know, and you have little young ones, future world changers, please be mindful on how you introduce science. And mm -hmm. I love how in the beginning of seeing all these mirrors, students around the world and educators and, and science enthusiasts are seeing all of us as a mirror and also peeking through a window and seeing, wow, how all the different cultures, how we all interconnect. Because when Carol was talking about astrobiology, I'm like, that's why I got into molecular genetics, four little chemicals. You know, that's yeah. all we are, four little code from a cockroach, come on, to a worm, to us, or a possibility out there as a carbon life form, forget about. And then figuring out if there is a non-carbon life form and how they have that genetic. It's exciting. I, it's, yeah, oh my God. yeah I'm, I'm it's like in awe right here, yeah. Now I have a question. Now you say that you use your your worms to study the geological changes in environments that often break down to a socioeconomic reality. So different things affect different soils and different waters. You know, when we talk about all the things that we're learning about in this country alone, about what like Flint and their water, and as opposed to what it what what was the effect? What was the whole? that was not addressed, that allowed that circumstance to exist. And now with global warming and land masses now being submerged, we're getting less and less land and all kinds of things are, are, are changing. What should we be thinking about as, as a society, as humans, to what we are doing, whether it's radio waves, whether it's you know these new faster internet connections, the 5G, they're talking about birds falling out of skies and all those different kinds of things. What should we be thinking of based on your research that we should be mindful as we move forward on this planet? Learn from the stewards who were here before us taking care of this land. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget about that. At one point before all this technology, there wasn't um, water contamination. There was natural, you know, climate change that happens naturally. Everything, mm -hmm. you know, has a movement. But um, learn from the caretakers, the stewards that were here before us, and empathy, kindness, empathy. knowing that you have fellow brothers and sisters who do not have water, but you do, but you don't care because you don't see it. Yeah. Open your eyes. So this is what I think phase one, empathy, care. Two, let's not have conversations. Let's have action. Action. Because I know action, action oriented conversations with, you know, if you need, you know, a rubric on how to do it, we could do it. Um, I think those are the, the key things that we need to do, because once you have a passion for it, that's when change can occur. That's when change can occur. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Naya, going back to the question, of, this is what a scientist you know, looks like. What inspired you? Where are you on your journey? You're, you said you're still a student. Are you in your 20s, 30s? I mean, are you looking for degrees? What is it that your trajectory looks like? Yes, ma'am. Um, so I am 25 and I'm currently in my PhD program. I've got my bachelor's and master's in aerospace engineering, but mm -hmm. um, my role models, I had to be sought out, um, you know, being a young black woman, I'm, I'm 
definitely younger, but um, growing up, they weren't super visible, I would say. And so I, I, I would seek out my role models. So even with Star Trek, that wasn't something I was familiar with up until my adulthood. Um, but I did come across Dr. Mae Jemison um, in the gym of my church, actually. <laughs> and I was enamored by her because I'd always loved space and science. But um, the thing that caught my eye about Dr. Mae Jemison was that she danced. And so it's really beautiful that you that you mentioned that Miss Marion about how Nichelle used to dance as well, because Mae Jemison is inspired by was inspired by Nichelle and had her full circle moment as the first astronaut on Star Trek. Um, and and now I'm inspired by um, May, who was almost like a professional dancer and, you know, and a philanthropist and humanitarian, but also decided to become an astronaut. And so I've always danced my entire life. It's looked different throughout life. It started with ballet. Now I do aerial dance kind of. So I'm in the air like a little circus lady. Um, and it's a lot of fun. But it's that's the part of me that I've never had to compromise as a scientist because dance has always been so different so natural to me. And so when I saw that, you know, someone as accomplished as Dr. Mae Jemison also having that passion, um, it really just gave me the drive that like, wow, I, I'm, I can do it all. And so when you ask what makes a good uh, scientist, the first thing that comes up that um, Dr. Akira started bringing up actually was, you know, the creativity. Um, you know, you, you need the tenacity to be okay with things not looking great, but you also need the creativity to solve those problems that do arise that you don't expect. And a lot of times that creativity, I mean, is fueled by how unique you are as a person. So like your experiences growing up, who you are, you know, what your influences were. And so I think the one, the biggest lesson I had to learn as a young black girl in a white male dominated field is that like, I bring a lot to the table being exactly who I am. I didn't need to mold myself into anybody else because it was mm -hmm. typically those perspectives that I had, you know, had growing up, that would be the answer to the problem that would arise. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because I didn't compromise my unique perspective trying to fit into a mold. And I definitely started that way. But when I learned that I didn't need to, it just gave me all that more power. So just don't compromise who you are to try to fit to any mold. Um, Odds are, uh, what makes you unique is what is is what's needed to get the job done. That's awesome. For those who don't know, can you tell them who Dr. Mae Jameson is? I sure did forget to mention her claim to fame. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Mae Jameson is the first, I, I want to say woman of color, not just black woman, but the first uh, woman of color to go to space. In 1992, she was aboard um, STS-49, I think. Uh, space Shuttle uh, Endeavor, which is the name of my car because of her. <laughs> um, and she became the first uh, woman to go to space. And then uh, her full circle moment with Star Trek and being inspired by Nichelle Nichols in 1993, mm -hmm. she became the first astronaut on Star Trek. So that's right. Um, yes, she's incredible. That's where I met her. I met her on set because we were shooting on the same lot. And I, I couldn't, I'm a, like I said, I'm a huge Trekkie. And when I heard, uh, you know, Deep Space Nine, was shooting around. So I was friends with Michael Dorn and you know, all of those guys and, and uh, oh my gosh, LeVar Burton. And so I was like, oh, who's on the set? What? So yeah, I sure did. And it's wonderful how, you know, one day someone sitting out there is gonna be looking at each of you and saying, that's who inspired me. Dr. Kara, Doc, Dr. Ideal, Dr. Naya, Doc, Dr. Gamble, Dr. Williams. And they're, and they're gonna be standing on your shoulders. And Ms. Marion Smothers, thank you for carrying on the legacy. So each of us is inspired by and stands on the legacy of someone else. Uh, so get ready for that moment when someone says, I became a scientist because I saw you and I read your pay paper and I studied your research. So Ron, Ron Gamble, what is your, this is what a scientist looks like. How old are you? How many millions of degrees do you have by the time you were 15? <laughs> I, I have, okay, so I, I've got, these are all great answers, by the way. I I want to keep connecting with all of you. Naya, I know we're friends. Don, I know you, but Kara, uh, Ideal, we're, please stay in touch after this. And so um, I have a bachelor's in physics. I have a master's in experimental high temperature superconductivity. Um, Say that again? I, Thank you. Yes. <laughs> experimental high temperature superconductivity. So they are, they are macroscopic quantum materials that I've worked on for my, my master's degree. Um, and then my PhD is in theoretical astrophysics. Uh, it was the first one at North Carolina A&T State University in HBCU. 
So all three of my degrees are from an HBCU, um, which is very rare in my field. It's extremely rare. I think I'm, I might be one of the only few to have done that. And how old um, are you? I, I am 34. Well, I will be 34 in March. Wow. So, and you and, accomplished all of that by what age? Oh, man, that was 27. 27 with three degrees. Yeah. Um, and so I, I taught in academia for seven years. I've designed six or seven courses on the graduate and graduate level, um, all, all by before I turned 34, actually. And so it's, it's been a long journey, but I've, I've got a lot more work to do here. It's amazing. Okay. So what else? Who inspired you? What, in, what inspired you into science? So I would I would say it was I, I've got to give credit where credit is due, and I've got to say my mother. My mom was a huge inspiration for me. Um, she was a big fan of Michelle Nichols uh, and Star Trek. I I watched Star Trek out the womb practically. I've I've seen them all almost um, from the Wrath of Khan movie all the way up to Star Trek Lower Decks is one of my favorites Thank and you. Discovery and Picard, all of them. Um, but my mom was really a true inspiration, I would say, because she's she's a biologist. She has a degree in biology from Fordham, um, but she she really taught me how to be unique as a scientist, right? So we've talked about kind of like the tenacity, the creativity, and you know the drive you have to have. But if you're unique as a scientist, then you're really going to stand out, and you're really going to be successful, and then inspire the next generation of scientists. And so she was a huge Michelle Nichols fan. So Marion, I know she would she would love for me to be on here and, and talk with you. Um, and so that's that's one of my inspirations. And I, I would say that, you know, with me being I'm an Afro Latino, so part of my family is from Panama. Um, shout out to shout out to us. Um, but I'm also an artist too. So I'm a musician, an artist, a scientist. We are black, we're Latino. We play games. We like we do it all. So that's that's part of what's being a great scientist, bringing your whole self to the field, so that people can see that you know we're not just in lab coats. Yes, we bury ourselves in equations, but we do other things also. Um, and so that's it's it's part of that uniqueness. That's truly that inspiration there for me. That's amazing. That's a, okay. Now talk about your educational trajectory because it sounds like you carved a path that didn't exist before you got there, what made oh you decide gosh. to do that in a place like an HBCU where that's not traditionally what's expected? It's it's not expected at all. In fact, it doesn't ever happen that way. Um, so I- But now it does because of you. But now it does, yes. Okay, so okay. The, the way I got my PhD, I, I actually, I took it upon myself and I stayed. I got waitlisted at a bunch of other schools Princeton, if you're listening, I got waitlisted. I'm still upset, but I, I, I stayed at A&T and HBCU because I figured, well, if someone's going to do this, it might as well be me. I might as well do it, do the hard yeah. part now, so that some other students coming up behind me can have an easier path. They can walk in my footsteps and have an easier path. They don't have to dig it out like I did. It was a okay. very hard. Uh, five years in grad school. So five years, I got two degrees, but it was very, very hard, very, very difficult. And then when you go out into the field and you present research, you do posters, conferences, and you have to explain to people where you got your degrees from, you said, well, it's from North Carolina A&T. I didn't know A&T had astrophysics. Well, they do now because I was there. Yeah, um, they so that me. program is growing up. The physics department there is awesome. Shout out to Dr. Cabetti, who is my mentor from 2008. So it's been a long time. Um, and so it is it is now possible for you to get a PhD in astrophysics at a because of me. So there's wow. anybody who's listening, That's awesome. please reach out if you want tips, if you want a mentor. I'm, I'm free to talk about it. Um, and so now moving forward, now a has a limelight on it. HBCUs have a limelight on them now. Because think now these things are possible. It's it's not an impossibility. It's not science fiction for you to be an astrophysicist from an HBCU. It's fact. These are real things. These are real people out here. That's phenomenal. That's that's phenomenal. And I'm sure you didn't go to to school with the intention of changing the world or changing the landscape 
All you wanted to do was I need a place where I can further the best of me that I want to further. And either this place is going to be supportive of it or I'm going to have to go somewhere else. So I applaud you for that because all too often as individuals, we think that, you know, it's going to take an army of us. What can me as one person do? And if your intention is to be the best you and to seek out the places and the people that will support you in being the best you, you move mountains. You know, I did the same thing at the University of Miami. I went as an opera singer, but I was also a dancer and an actor. So I added those classes to my curriculum ending up within three months of my freshman year as a, as a 16 year old, they built a new degree program around me. And since I've graduated, the musical theater degree program has graduated Tony winners, Oscar winners, Emmy winners. And this has been going on for decades. I just wanted a place where I could do me. And it turned out that I transformed the landscape. And I believe that's what each and every one of you on this panel has, has, has done in your own way and being authentic, you are transforming the landscape. So David, tell us about your your journey. Your this is what a scientist looks like. What inspired you and how old are you and where are you in your in your journey? Sure, I'm 57 right now. I have uh, had a career for 34 years. Um I was really inspired to get into science by growing up, you know, watching the science fiction of the 1970s, uh mm -hmm. particularly the Star Trek when it was syndicated 5 nights a week. When I would come home and do homework, it would be on TV, uh, Space 1999, The Six Million Dollar Man, The Bionic Woman, you know, plus also the atmospheric test of the U.S. Space Shuttle Enterprise when that was being tested in the 70s. Right. And then finally, uh, Carl Sagan's PBS series Cosmos aired in 1980, right when I started high school. And that really uh, inspired me, you know, look at the totality of the human existence and how science has affected us, how science has affected our history, all of us there. And so those things really wanted me, to, uh, motivated me to be involved in space, uh, in, in science. I did, majored a lot of physical sciences classes in high school. I went to Indiana University, my undergrad degrees in astronomy and astrophysics, but I switched into geology in graduate school for a master's and then a PhD after nine years of graduate school. So, um, you know, it's been a great career. I'm sort of in the last third of mine uh, right about now. But, you know, uh, I would say the couple of things to keep in mind as far as traits when one wants to become a scientist is commitment. You know, when you go to college to study to become a scientist, you have to learn everything about your field. Um, so it takes time. It's not a nine to five Monday through Friday job. You know, you have to put it in the time, particularly in graduate school, to learn all of this stuff. But mm -hmm. you also have to remember to keep a work-life balance, even as a graduate student. I took ballroom dancing classes. I hiked the Grand Canyon rim to rim. You know, wow. uh, I did that as a graduate student there. And, and, you know, as I've gotten older, since I got married, you know, I've gotten into uh, wine tasting. I'm interested in history. Uh, I still do hiking. And here in Phoenix, Arizona, I'm heavily involved in our local Star Trek fan club, which is one of the oldest continuously running clubs in the country. And we've been doing activities together every two weeks since 1975. Wow. So, you know, there's, there's, there's things that you can do. So commitment and the other is flexibility. You know, I started out as a volcanologist, just like, uh, you know, Kara there studying volcanoes and lava flows. That was the first part of my career, but then I got the opportunity to switch and do work on these innovative missions to visit the asteroids uh, of the solar system. If you would have told me that in 2007, I would have laughed in your face, but the opportunity was there. Our business is very mm -hmm. opportunistic. So, yes. you know, never be afraid to take advantage of an opportunity. If one door closes, usually another one opens, and that'll just increase your knowledge and experience and ability to do science wherever it occurs. It's, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. I've had a wonderful career. I, I work with and I supervise some great students, graduate students, um, and helping them get started on their careers. That's phenomenal. And I love your well-rounded life. You work hard and play hard. I love it. I Indeed. love it. Just a, a quick question and just a, 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 a few words. Each of you, each journey is very challenging. And each of you has encountered your own personal challenges on your journey. What kind of words of encouragement or skill did, did you use or thing did you tap into to help get you through? 
whether it was grad school and studying or being the only or being, you know, whatever it, it was. I'm just going to go around. David, let's start with you since you were the last person we heard from. What, what, did, what helped you get through and pers- pers- persevere? I would say uh, my parents had always encouraged me. uh, When I indicated I wanted to be a scientist, they encouraged me uh, 100% all the way. My colleagues, my peers in graduate school, I've had really good professors. I had really good peers. Mm -hmm. They're they're sort of your emotional support group when you're in graduate school. And they they help you through the tough, tough times to keep, keep going through. Um, and then uh, your, your interest, you know, your, the things that you do outside of school. I'm, I'm fortunate that, Original series Star Trek is what inspired me to become a scientist. And then the, all the other incarnations of Star Trek have been sort of like a companion on the way because mm-hmm. TNG was involved, was there when I was in undergrad, DS9 and Voyager when I was in grad school, Enterprise when I was a postdoc, and now all the modern series uh, uh, that are going on right now um, are, are basically added inspiration to keep going and doing this. Excellent. So friends Excellent. and family and colleagues and, and your outside interests, they're the things that, that, that keep me going. Okay. Ideal. How about, how about you? It's, it's, I don't mean to be morbid, but it's like, cause I didn't want to be a statistic. So I'm like, mm-hmm. why not me? Okay. So I belonged. So knowing, finding, um, uh, those who lift me up as I lift them up, my interest in science um, and knowing that I belonged, that's what kept me through. And then I was fortunate to have family while going through grad school. So I kept that work-life balance because I was told, no, you can either do one or the other when I got into graduate school. No, I did both. So anything at fun. How about you, Kara? Um, I'm actually, this is calling to mind Jadzia Dex, my girl from Deep Space Nine. She was a scientist who was extremely smart. Everyone was turning to her for her opinion about things. She was like the person on the, on the space station. And she also had a really good time. She had fun. She had a fun life. She did not fit into the scientist stereotype. And when I was thinking about what I really wanted to do with my future, I thought about what kind of life I wanted for myself. And I thought about her. So it's kind of a, I get to focus on these intellectual pursuits during the day and also on the education and outreach opportunities I'm really interested in. But I also spend a lot of time on the weekend going camping and hiking, rock climbing, things like that. Watch a lot of TV, watch a lot of Star Trek, hang out with my cat. Um, so I want everyone to think about, you know, what do you want your day to look like? And I think that's going to guide you towards what your future will be. How about you, Naya? Um, my, my answer is pretty simple. It's all of those things, but most of all, God, <laughs> I'm very uh, spiritually inclined. And, um, yeah, I've, there, there, there's no way, uh, w- without, you know, my relationship with our creator and, or with my creator. And, um, I think that wisdom that I, I've gained from my relationship or my spiritual relationship has given me the wherewithal to seek out the things that do make me happy. So, um, one of those things is my hobby of being an aerialist and, you know, dancing and yoga and um, seeking out mental health resources. I'm really passionate about those um, and making sure that I'm honest about my mental health journey as well. And so um, I, I would say it's those three things. And then, of course, family is huge to me. I'm very family oriented. Mm-hmm. And so somebody's pet just walked in and I have a lot of pets. It's Mary. Mary. She, opened, <laughs> she actually opened the door. I love it. <laughs> Very familiar with that life. I have three cats and a dog, and so I'm very much a a, a fur mom, and and they keep me sane as well. So it's it's um I love the way uh, Dr. Brugman put it. Is that you know what do you want your life to look like? And I think I'm right now living all my passions at once: pets, dance, and That's science. Awesome. That's awesome, <laughs> Ron. Okay, so mine mine is a little little touchy here, and I I uh, I like to tell my students the ones that I've been mentoring for a number of years now um, that in order for you to, you know, to be in this, in this field, to do what we do, you, you have to, you got to fight for it. Um, And that means fighting for it, even if you have to fight yourself. Um, And so that's one thing I tell all of the students that I mentor fight for it, even if you have to fight yourself, because you are your worst enemy sometimes. 
Sometimes mm-hmm. you'll listen to the crowd. You'll listen to people saying that you can't do it. You listen to people that say that you can't be there. You can't, you know, be a Latino or a Latina and be a scientist and do these things because there's not a lot of us there. Or, you know, you can't be black or you can't be from somewhere else or you just can't be weird. Or you can't be nerdy. Or, you know, you can be all those things, but you got to fight for it. Um, and so I would I, I like to give tell my students when I when I'm mentoring them, you know, come up with like a six word memoir. What do you what do you want your your legacy to look like? What do you want to leave behind? Um, and so I, I like to say if I were to say it very succinctly, you know, your battle scars are dreams deferred. Just because you fought for something and you didn't get it initially, that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Um, I'm I'm proof of that. That's it. It can happen. I am not supposed to be here with these degrees, working at NASA and studying black holes like myself. I'm, we're not supposed to be here statistically, um, but we are here. And so there's we're a wide rainbow of people here doing can, great science, doing great things in our lives, um, and then looking back and looking at our students our mentors, our mentees, and saying, yeah, we can do it. But I don't want to do this by myself. I want others to join me. So, And I don't want to look around when I'm 80 or something and be the only one still. I want a whole crew of people who are like us doing some great science, going about looking at the world and and having fun with it. That's amazing. Now, Marion, I know that you did not live Michelle's life, but you were the closest thing right now that we have to her. And I know you observed a lot. And we are so, as you've heard, each person mention what an inspiration she was to each and every one of us for different reasons. Can you share with us some of the inside information of what it took for her to endure? What, who or what were some of her inspirations? We've heard the story that Dr. King, when she wanted to quit Star, Star Trek, she didn't want to be there anymore. And Dr. King says, no, you have to stay. The world has to see you there. We we need you there. And that encouraged her to say, okay, go back to Mr. Roddenberry and say, okay, can I take my resignation back? And he is like, absolutely. What were the kinds of things that she endured? We're standing on her show. So there are certain things we don't have to repeat because that battle's already been fought and, and won. The, there were battles that were fought and won before Nichelle, since Nichelle. But please share with us what were some of her battles, some of the things that she encountered, maybe some of them are the same things we're dealing with today, or because she fought that battle, that's why we don't have to fight that battle today. I would uh, probably go back to say the encouragement of our parents, my mother and father, especially uh, her relationship with our father. Um, He had a PhD. He had gone to Howard University back in the 20s when um and he had um uh associates in the black community that became doctors lawyers indian chiefs all of that and became very successful um he became a father very young and had 10 children and nichelle mm-hmm. was probably out of that she was probably the fourth or let's see fifth fifth of his children um he he oh gosh this just takes me back so so very much but i can remember as a young girl when she was dancing and she did become a professional dancer before she became a professional singer before she became a professional actress um but I remember being a, a young girl and he would sit there with a drum with drums like a bongos uh, set mm-hmm. and he would play out uh, the beats for her while she took her steps and danced and maneuvered and got better and better. But she she if you if she was here right now, she would say how much our father influenced her. He was a great philosopher. He had people in the house all the time coming to ask his advice for various different things. Um, And Nichelle was very gregarious. She had to know everything. There was no just uh, give her an answer and she was gone. You could do that to me. And I was like, okay, goodbye. But Nichelle was there for every, she, she just wanted to pull every ounce of whatever you had out of you. And that's what she did. And that's how she learned. And that's how she, um, became who she was. She's a, a great fighter 
you know, and she always believed in herself and um, against all the odds. And again, we're the we're products of um, of the forties and fifties, mm -hmm. and so we came up trying to be being held down, being pushed yeah. down, and having to fight um, to the height of the civil rights. Yeah, movement, yeah, the height of the civil of rights movement. Yeah. All of that and her uh, fight within that, for, in her own way, with the th civil rights, you know. Um, but um, she's just, I'm trying to think who else was. Uh, there was um, an actor, probably you don't remember his name, was um, Frank Silvera. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, he was a big actor in the 50s and 60s, and he was another influence on her. He had... Um, Burgess Meredith, uh, our names, yeah. I remember. Um, Burgess Meredith, yes. Yeah, and so, um, but again, you know, I was kind of removed for, from it. I got married very young and started having kids, boom, 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 boom. And um, I had an opportunity in 94 when she wrote her book to go to New York with her and be around and I was just blown away. Not that I hadn't gone to any of the conventions and things, but um, attending that book fair with her and the tour with her and how awe-inspiring that she was. She be all of a sudden became more awe-inspiring all over again to me. And um, it's just been a wonderful journey. I, I hope that answers some of your questions. It does. No, thank you so much. I mean, it just, I just need to, I want to remind people of how all of us are inspired on some level by someone else. It doesn't just start with us. You know, right. the, sometimes people believe, oh, I created this. I am the beginning. I am the end. I am, you know, all of those kinds of things. When the reality is each of us stands on someone else's shoulders. We're walking through a door that someone else carved out for us, either knowingly or unknowingly. I mean, Michelle as a dancer, being a dancer myself, Naya, you being a dancer, you get you get body shamed. Well, if you're gonna be a dancer, you have to study at this kind of school, you have to have this kind of body or you don't belong. And Michelle, what I really loved about her was that she was committed to bringing people with her. That was something that Doc, Dr. Gamble said. It's not just about her. And so while she was on television, while she was at the height of her own career, she actually put her own career and her own personal success on the line to become an activist, to become an advocate. And all it did was elevate her star higher. It went so far beyond film and television to where she went to aerospace, where she went to NASA and said, this doesn't have to just be in the movies. This can be real life. And you know what? I am willing to use my platform to help you get the resources and the access to people of color, men of color, women of color, students of color. We need to see more astronauts, more actual human beings, not just actors, not just cartoon characters actually filling these seats and filling this role. So, I mean, some people only know her for her work on television, but she is just so much more than that. So much more. Than Absolutely. that, and uh, Naya, to your point, my my endurance in this journey it comes from the grace of God, and me believing that the reason I have the talents I have, the reason I have the opportunities that I have, is because God gifted them to me. So while it's not always easy to endure or hear some of the hurtful things, some of the limiting things, some of the minimizing things that people will say to you or do to you, or opportunities people will try to block you from, all I can do is keep giving thanks to God to say, okay, you would not have deposited this in me to hold me back, to, with, to withhold it from me. So I daily, moment by moment, give thanks for the earthly angels, for the people he surrounds me with that continue to speak positivity to me, to help me find the better parts of myself. My teachers, I went to public school. I didn't go to any fancy school. I didn't live in any expensive neighborhood. Um, you know, each of us has our own journeys. I grew up in a home with domestic violence. You know, all kinds of things that could have been not excuses, but reasons for why I only went but so far and only made certain choices 
for myself. So anybody out there watching, we are all grateful for this. And I'm speaking, forgive me if I speak out of turn, but for those of us on the panel who are achieving certain things and are and are moving the needle in certain areas, trust me, we did not start here. And we are still in the midst of our journey. There's still much more that each of us wants to do. But please don't think that it was just handed to us, that it was just easy and it continues to be easy now that we're here. No, no. I mean, each of us, I'm sure if we had more time, we could go into personal stories of challenges. So any of you who are out there experiencing challenges, please don't quit on yourself. Please continue to seek out panels such as this one, opportunities, people such as these in this group and those in your own circle and your community to find positivity, to find a positive spin on wherever it is. I know we are at the end of our panel, so we combined some answers. We talked about your interests outside of science. We talked about your inspirations. We talked about the fun things that you do and the hopes and aspirations you have for the fields that you are, are currently in. I applaud each and every one of you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm gonna to give everyone an opportunity to say just a few brief last words before we sign off. But I wanna remind any of you who is here joining us today, this is the Michelle Nichols Foundation. And we are excited about planting seeds for the futures of young, particularly young, young girls. But, but you know what, young man, if you wanna come on, we can make a way, we can make some room for each of you too, because it's gonna take all of us. So if you're so inclined, please look in the, in, in, in the crawl on ways that you can don donate to the Michelle Nichols Foundation. We've got space camp coming up. We've got all kinds of scholarships and programs that we want to provide to those that are interested. And uh, you too, or your child, can be any one of these people here and then some, because this is what a scientist looks like. So anybody have any last words that they want to share? And please, we're going to keep it brief because we're going to wrap this up. I'll just go around the circle. Um, David. It's been a great pleasure to be here and to meet everybody and to talk to all of you. Um, if you are in the Phoenix area, come seek me out at Arizona State. Uh, uh, Dr. Kara and I are going to be doing a screening for Star Trek Picard Season 1 on Thursday of this week. If you yeah. happen to be in Las Vegas for a creation Star Trek convention, I give back to fandom by doing Star Trek uh, NASA Space Science panels at creation and Star Trek convention Las Vegas every August. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, I hope to see all of you uh, around here in the future. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, up next, Kara. Uh, everyone out there, thank you for coming. Thank you so much to Don and to Marion. And I just want to remind everybody, be true to yourself, believe in yourself, stay curious. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Ideal. Oh, yes. Well, I'm so grateful to be here. I can't wait to collaborate with everyone. Um, let's definitely connect harder and make a change. And if there's anyone out there interested in doing citizen science work, soil science work, identifying nematodes, please contact me. If you don't have the materials, I could send you the materials, no cost. And yes, keep curious and you know you belong. Excellent. Naya? I just I just want to reiterate my thank you for being here and thank you to all the panelists. I've been I've been watching, but I've um, and I'm participating, but also learning so much from each and every one of you. Um, and I'm just really grateful that I've been um, able to participate alongside so many uh, incredible and esteemed professionals. So thank you for having me. Absolutely, Dr. Gamble, Ron. So yeah, I'm gonna close this out here. I think this was a fantastic panel. You are all incredible. Um, with you know, it's an example of us doing incredible things by incredible people. I'm happy to be here, Don. It was all. It's always a pleasure working with you, Marianne. It's so grateful to meet you and have that connection to Michelle, um, Dr. Gonzalez, Sergio, Naya, Dr. Brugman, Dr. Williams. It was a pleasure. Um, again, so stay curious, stay creative, stay unique, stay weird, be nerdy. It's all right. It's cool. It's fun. <laughs> 
I'm excited to have been here. Uh, as the Michelle Nichols Foundation, I too have my own nonprofit. It's called the A New Day Foundation, where we do programmatic and financial support to underserved youth across the country and abroad. We have given programs to students here in California, from California to New York City, as far away as Guyana, South America, New Delhi, India, and India, and just everywhere. We go where the need is. So if you want more information about the A New Day Foundation, please feel free to check out our site, anewdayfoundation.net. Um, and again, all of our programs we provide free of charge. So all of, donation, all of the donations sent to us go to giving scholarships and supporting our programs. So I want to thank each and every one of you for coming today. Thank you for being inspired. Stay inspired. Be committed to being your best self and being patient with yourself and willing to persevere to accomplish whatever that means. And I am absolutely going to give the final word of today to the president of the Nichelle Nichols Foundation, Miss Nichelle Nichols' sister, Miss Marion Smothers. Marion, please take us home. Oh my God, thank you. Um, it's, it's just a pleasure to be among so many beautiful young people. I know that the future is in your hands. I know Nichelle, and I can go to sleep peacefully knowing that all of this is not for naught. Uh, with the hell going on in our society right now, sometimes we lose um, something in us goes away and says, "Where are we going?" You know what? You know we're at this point in twenty twenty three. Where where are we going? Are we get, are we getting lost? Are where are we going? What are we doing to ourselves? What are we doing to humanity? And then when I see you guys, you give me such hope. You give me such. I know that when the time comes for me, I can go peacefully, knowing that it's in such wonderful hands as yours, and the Nichelle Nichols Foundation is thriving to keep this going, uh, bringing up more and more people like you who have the tenacity, the will, the the strength, the drive, the love to keep going with this. And I just applaud you all. You, I just, mm, I love you all. Thank you so much for participating here. Thank, Thank you. you for being here and sharing your stories. I am just blown away. Absolutely. So from our experimental petrologist, Dr. Kara Brugman, our student of aerospace engineering, Dr. Nye, well, Naya Craig Butler, Butler Craig, sorry, Naya Butler Craig, our astrophysicist, Dr. Ron Gamble Jr., our scientist and educator, Ms. Ideal Gonzalez Sericchio, yes, and our research professor, Dr. David Williams. Thank you, each and every one. Live long and prosper. Blessings.